morning, everyone. We're starting this week with chapter nine. It's the only chapter we're doing, but there's a lot to cover. So let's go ahead and get started. You can go ahead and read through the objectives if you like. So the postpartum period. It's the six weeks following childbirth. It's also known as the purpurum. Um, fourth trimester of pregnancy is another term for it. So it's a six week interval from childbirth to return of the uterus and other organs to a pre-pregnant state. So immediate postpartum is considered one to 24 hours. This is just talking about the purpurum or the postpartum period. So adapting care to specific groups and cultures. You know, we talk about this every chapter in some way or another. Just again, we need to try to um, be very accommodating if we possibly can for people's um, cultures and beliefs. Even if we don't agree with it, we need to try to adapt and um, respect their wishes. There's also adolescence that um, can be difficult because they just seem to need more help learning, you know, parenting skills. Peer group is super important to them. A lot of times they just think having a baby is a big party. They bring, before of course the COVID thing, they bring their whole posse with them and um, it's like a party. But um, they want to fit in with their peers and that's very important to them. And they're often very passive and caring for themselves. They, they honestly kind of just aren't mature enough sometimes, not always, some are very mature. But to know, you know, what they should and shouldn't be doing, or is the nurse supposed to be doing that? Should I ask if I should do that? Things like that. It just gets kind of awkward. They might also be single and poor. And poor young adolescents have, can have short, uh, a lot of children in a very short amount of time, which can really compound the social issues for these people. Think about them. They're still kids, and they um, still want to have a social life and do things with their friends and at first it all sounds so wonderful until it really sinks in and then it can be super hard for them. And then a single woman of course probably a lot of times they have to support themselves and the baby and have to get child care and they have to return to work fairly quickly and that can be very very difficult more difficult than most people anticipate when they're getting ready to do that. Then um, families below the poverty level at or below, boy, they can have a hard time meeting the needs. And, um, you know, they, try, they should try to get help. There's lots of help in most communities getting car seats and things they need for the birth of this child. But they have to figure out that. And lots of times they don't even have transportation to the hospital to have the baby. And so they call an ambulance, things like that. It's. It's super sad sometimes. And what about families who have twins or more? The strain and expense of all that can be very difficult and they may have um, newborns that have issues. A lot of twins triplets, of course, are born prematurely. So that can be very difficult. What if one twin is doing well and comes home and the other twin's still in the hospital? How do you divide your time? Things like that. It can, um, and then, you know, individuality of these twins, parents trying to figure that out. So they require um, a lot of support and guidance. Okay. So again, we need to adapt to fit their health beliefs, their values, practices, interpreters. That gets really tricky. If um, I'll get, we've talked about, you know, at our hospital, it's called the MARTI. It stands for something. I can't remember what something obviously interpretive services, but um, it's a like an iPad that you take into the patient room. You call a number and depending on what language and things like that, you guys have probably used them at other places, but it aids the woman in being able to understand and provide optimal care to her infant. They, they don't like it to be a family member because sometimes family members don't interpret it correctly or don't want to go there. Or maybe it's a very um, hard question like maybe I saw in their prenatal that there was HIV positive, things like that. We need to have a discussion. Well, the family shouldn't be the interpreter for something like that. And um, 
but if they insist, I had one not long ago that she was from Guatemala and she insisted that her husband be her interpreter. And that's fine. You just have to document that that was there at their request. And remember that affirmative nods may be a sign of courtesy rather than understanding. I can't tell you how many times they look at me and they nod and it is completely obvious to me that they don't have a clue what I just said. But they want to act like they understand or they're being courteous, things like that. So that's why return demonstrations are the best indication that the patient understands the instructions and you can give, you know, a lot of pointers when they do return demonstration. So goals of postpartum care, I added this one in you guys. We are on page 209 right now, but just um, I thought it stated it well. Assist and support the woman's recovery to the pre-pregnant state and identify deviations from the norm, okay? Educate the mother about her own self-care and newborn feeding and care. You need to be doing this all along, way before discharge happens. And of course, promote bonding between newborn and family. If the mom has a C-section, the baby is usually put on her chest for a while, but then the dad and the baby go to the nursery with us. And I'll say, do you wanna do skin to skin, touch your baby, things like that. They Dads oftentimes don't know what they can and can't do or should do. They're scared, a lot of them. So it's up to us to help them understand that, right? Postpartum changes in the mother. Okay, so immediately after deliver the delivery, the mother experiences multiple physiological changes. Think about all the changes that have happened during pregnancy that are now trying to get back to normal. A lot of it is hormonal too, so women can be a little kooky sometimes, a little crazy, and it's not their fault. So it's important for the nurse to assess all body systems, not just the ones from having a baby, because everything is affected when women are pregnant and have a baby. Okay, so the uterus, of course, it undergoes tremendous change, involution. Okay, involution is the changes that the reproductive organs, especially the uterus, undergo after birth, and then again, return to their pre-pregnant size and condition. It undergoes rapid reduction in the size and weight after birth, and the uterus should return to the pre-pregnant size by five to six weeks after delivery. So the failure of the uterus to return to the pre-pregnant state after six weeks is called sub-involution. And we'll talk more about that in another chapter, but that's something that women have to deal with and why they go to the doctor and we'll, more often, and we'll discuss that um, later. Okay, uterine lining is kind of interesting. The uterine lining, the endometrium, it's called that when you're not pregnant, decidua during pregnancy. It shed when the placenta detaches. A basal layer of the lining remains to generate new endometrium to prepare for future pregnancies. The placental site where it came off of is fully healed in six to seven weeks. Okay, so then we go down to descent of the uterine fundus. This is something as an OB nurse that is extremely important to know where that fundus is. So you're gonna find questions on the test about this. Immediately after delivery of placenta, fundus is midline or just below the umbilicus. So if you put a finger on the umbilicus and press down, you should feel the fundus, the top of the uterus, sitting right there. And you can see this to the right. You can see the belly button. That's the reference point at delivery. And on day nine, you can see how it should be very tiny again, but still large on day one because it takes time for it to go down, right? Okay, so it descends at a predictable rate as the muscle cells contract to control the bleeding at the placental insertion site and as the size of each muscle cell decreases. So that's what makes the uterus go down. Um, so after 24 hours, the fundus begins to descend about one centimeter, one finger's width. That's the, how you judge it each day. By 10 days postpartum, it should no longer even be palpable. You should not feel that uterus. If you do, then that's usually sub-involution. And like I said, we'll talk about that in another chapter. 
Okay, now we're moving on to page 210. After pains. They um, can be miserable. You have someone who's had five, six babies. Think how stretched out those muscles of that uterus are. And so that body is trying so hard to clamp down that muscle so that she doesn't bleed that it feels like basically like muscle spasms in your abdomen and it's miserable. You ask somebody who's had five, six babies, they say that was worse than the pain of childbirth. And they can be, they can do childbirth just fine and then writhe in pain afterwards. So it's a real thing. Thank goodness it decreases rapidly within about 48 hours postpartum. Now they have more after pains if a baby suckles well if, at breast. So um, because the newborn suckling causes posterior pituitary to release oxytocin, that contracts the uterus, right? That's what we use to contract down the uterus. So the more a baby breastfeeds well, the better contracted the uterus can be. So one of the best things you can do is put, it, put a baby to breast if a mom's bleeding a little heavy, but make sure the baby's latched correctly. Think about in the old days, we didn't have all those medications to give women. And we hear a lot of them had a baby out in the field, got up and worked again. Well, they put the baby to breast to control the bleeding. That's how we didn't have as many postpartum hemorrhages back then, is that's what they did. They just hung the baby there in a blanket or whatever and kept on working, right? But it was the breastfeeding that helped them not hemorrhage, okay? Okay, somehow I accidentally skipped a slide, but you guys can look at it. It's about Lochia, and of course, that's one of the most important ones. But we're moving on to page um, 211. So, it's the discharge, the vaginal discharge after delivery is Lochia. Okay, Lochia rubra is red. Rubra stands for red, and it is composed mostly of blood, and it lasts for about three days after birth. Now, the thing you've got to remember is it can be scant, light to moderate after birth. When you get more concerned if is it too much or the uterus is getting too high above the umbilicus, filling up with blood, not coming out, or no blood, that means the blood's just getting trapped inside somewhere and building. So, but if you had a test question that said something about um, light lochia, and fundus at you, then that's normal. And just continue your 15 minute assessments. So I just want you guys to remember that. Okay, uh, Lochia serosa is pink because it's blood and mucus content and it lasts from about the third through the 10th day. Lochia alba is the uh, mostly clear and colorless whitish yellowish. It lasts from about the 10th through the 21st day after birth. It does have a characteristic fleshy or menstrual odor, but it should never have a foul odor, okay? So if a mother has excessive discharge of lochia, a clean pad should be put on there and we keep an eye on it. They shouldn't saturate, I mean like where you can wring it out, a pad within an hour, but you check every 15 minutes and we weigh them or count them if we feel that it's more than the normal amount of postpartum bleeding, okay? The flow of Loki is briefly heavier when the mother ambulates just because it's pulled down in there in the vagina. And when they stand up, all of a sudden it all comes out. But as long as it stops or it's just one or two little clots, then that's fine. It's when things keep on coming that we get concerned. So a few small clots at this time um, are normal. And women who've had a recent cesarean section, they have usually less bleeding because when the doctor's back there doing the surgery, they literally take um, wet cloths and um, wipe out the uterus. So they've already cleaned it out. They've already done the job for the body. And so they don't have as much bleeding, but Again, the absence 
of lochia is not normal and may be associated with blood clots retained within the uterus or with infection, okay? So fundal assessments, I think this was one I added. Sorry, I tried to put three stars on them, but I kind of started that into it so you'd know this was an added slide so you didn't get lost. We're on page 211, but fundal assessments, you check them every 15 minutes for the first hour, usually should be firm and contracted, should be at you or below. It can be scant to moderate. You check the bladder, make sure it's not filling up. Women should be taught to report foul-smelling lochia. Of course, that would be a sign of infection. And rubra that persists beyond the third day. You know, it should have turned into serosa by this time. So if it's still red, we need to be looking at why. Or of course, if it's, of course, if it's unusually heavy. Or lochia that returns to bright red after it has progressed to serosa or alba. What I tell my patients is, if it's just a little bit of the red, Usually, this is usually after they go home. It means you're overdoing it. Sit down, put your feet up, drink some water, you're overdoing it. Now, if we're talking big clots or saturating a pad in an hour, things like that, that's not normal. So it's kind of some, it's education that we need to give to our patients that's normal versus not normal. Okay, so descent. So nursing care, of course, with checking funduses and descent of the fundus, it's assessed at routine intervals for firmness, location, you know, at you, below you, above you, and position. Is it midline? Is it to the side? Where is it? And then um, it's essential not to push down on an uncontracted uterus because we don't want to invert. And I have a picture coming up to show you. And also in your book on page 210, that picture up to the right, it shows you you put a hand on the bottom of the uterus and the top of the uterus. Because if you press down on the top, the fundus, you can make that uterus um, invert. And that is an absolute emergency if it starts coming out the opening of the os, the cervix. Okay, so... Um, if the, there's a full bladder, it can contribute to poor uterine contraction and the mother should be assisted to the bathroom or a bedside, uh, bedside commode or a bedpan. So a full bladder can push the uterus up and cause it to deviate to one side and interfere with involution. So the nurse should assist the woman to empty her bladder. There's a question on the quiz and I want you guys to hear me right now. You prioritize on these questions okay I found that a lot of people read into this question in the past most people are like oh I got to call the doctor this and that no if everything else is normal her vital signs are normal her bleeding is normal everything else is fine in the question it does not say that she's hemorrhaging or anything like that if everything is fine and you notice that the fundus is off to one side and a little bit high we go have her empty your bladder and see if that fixes the problem. So again, blood clots, if they collect, they can stop, they can make the fundus rise and make it feel soft or boggy where you can't even find the fundus. And that gets a little scary. Okay, so here just gives you an idea of the colors and stuff. The rubra, it's heaviest during the first one to two hours after delivery usually. It's initially bright red, right to the to the right. It's definitely red, lasts from birth to about three days, and may contain small clots. So I thought this was very interesting. Don't pay, don't worry about the days on here if it conflicts with your book. What I mostly wanted you to see what it contains. So rubra contains blood and deciduous trophoblastic trophoblastic debris, small nickel-sized clots are common. Serosa is um, old blood serum. That's what gives it that pink or brown look. Leukocytes, tissue debris. Alba is leukocytes, epithelial cells, mucus serum bacteria. So it's kind of interesting the makeup of each one of these discharges for the mom. So down at the bottom here, you can see the colors. It's kind of like that. The middle one's a little bit pinkish. It's usually a little bit more brownish or, but um, pink is, you know, can be that too. 
Okay, so there's medications on page um, 212 that they talk about giving if um, need be. If you're, say you go in and you do your fundal check and that fundus is boggy and she's bleeding too much, things like that, you want to give Pitocin, which is you on 99.9% .9 of my patients, we give it after every delivery, IV fairly fast. And, um, but you may need to hang another bag or give more milli units, things like that. Methogen is an IM medication that is one of the other ones we give for bleeding if it's, it helps clamp down the uterus. But again, a newborn suckling at breast has similar effect, releases natural oxytocin that stimulate uterine contractions. So that is always something to keep in mind. Okay. Let's also remember that the woman should, you should educate your patient to report any foul smelling lochia with or without fever. Again, the rubra that persists, if they feel like their bleeding's too heavy, I always use their period as an example. If it's like a period, that's normal. If it's more than that or saturating that pad in an hour, then it's something to tell me about. Okay. So let's talk about the cervix. The cervix regains its muscle tone, but never closes as tightly as pre-pregnant. That's how you can usually tell a multip cervix from a primip cervix. If you did a speculum exam, you'd be able to tell for the most part if they had a baby before, okay? Um, a con I wanted to go over a constant trickle of brighter red lochia is not normal. So here we're talking about the cervix, okay? That can be a sign of a tear, not bleeding coming from inside the uterus. This is a tear in the cervix from maybe the patient started pushing too soon when she's only dilated to nine and it tore it. And it's just this steady trickle of bright red blood or a laceration in the, on the vaginal wall, things like that. So um, that moves us on to the vagina. Obviously it undergoes stretching during childbirth. The rugae disappear. Remember the rugae is what helps move that fetal head down in labor. So then they disappear after delivery. They be, the walls of the vagina become smooth and spacious. They do come back later, but anyways, we also need to discuss with the, the healthcare provider and talk with the patient about when to resume sexual intercourse after delivery. Usually it's when everything's pretty much healed up, especially if they had an episiotomy or stitches in there or things like that. Okay. So the perineum, and a lot of this depends, of course, on whether they've had a, an episiotomy or a laceration, how tender it's going to be and how much care it needs. But whenever we get them up to the bathroom, we always use a peri bottle with warm water, not cold water, warm water to cleanse down there and always teach them to wipe from front to back or pat is what I tell them to do from front to back maybe edematous, tender, and have ecchymosis, and I have a picture of that. Here's the vagina first that can be very edematous and bruised. Again, by week three, resumes pre-pregnant appearance. Rugae begin to appear. See on the side walls of this vagina, the rugae, and in the very center, that hole, that is the cervix, but look how swollen and edematous it is, especially on the top part. So this patient gave birth not long ago. By week six is almost regained um, pre-pregnant form. Still may notice dryness, which usually disappears when ovulation and menstruation return. Okay, so here's the cervix. So after birth, it's soft. By 18 hours postpartum, it's regained its usual form. Gradually closes around two weeks. And again, you don't get that regular, that normal appearance. So Two pictures here, down on the left is before having a baby, on the right is after having a baby. Same thing, A and B, see how that small little hole in the middle is the cervix? And B, see how it's kind of that slice in there? That's someone who's had a baby before. So the os looks like a slit instead of a circle or a dot usually. So here you go with that perineum, I added this in. It's See how it's edematous and bruised? Now, most people don't look this bad, but some do. So 
So we assess the type and amount of vaginal discharge, any unusual swelling, because that can be a sign of a hematoma, right? Discoloration, that can also be hematoma, the blue look. She almost looks like she has one up to the left up top. And how much discomfort, if they get a hematoma down there, they're pretty miserable. And this is where you need to keep ice packs on them, sits baths, we give them tucks, and we talk more about that, okay? So, oh, right here. Okay, and you have a picture of this in your book also on um, skill 9-4 about the sits baths. They're just super handy to have. We give those to patients if they want or need them. And they're like a bidet. So what we do for interventions is we apply he colder heat. It's usually cold for the first 24 hours, and then it can be heat after that. Sits baths right here. It just um, promotes comfort and healing and reduces incidence of affection. It gets it clean. But you shouldn't do it for longer than 20 minutes at a time. And the patient may feel a little weak after that. It kind of brings a lot of that blood down to that area. And so it can make you feel a little woozy. So we always tell the patients to get up very slowly. They can also use topical anesthetics for this. Like um, we use dermaplast and we use a lot of tucks also. And not just for hemorrhoids, but it, it's very soothing to the perineum. And the other thing people use is hydrocortisone and epithalm. We don't use that where I work, but it doesn't mean other hospitals don't. Okay, so again, we need to teach them after any sits bath, any going to the bathroom, anything like that, do perineal care. After voiding bowel movement, you know, use your little squirt bottle. And the perineum is blotted dry. Again, they should use their peri pads, put them from front and not back to front. And when they remove them, take them from um, front to back. So let's see. Got to the tucks here. Moving on to the next one. Okay, so again, the perineum. So in your book, you have this whole Rita thing. And I also put it here. It's on, yours is a memory jogger on page 213. Very, very, very good information to know, okay? And so the RETA assessment, which we'll go over in a minute, the in, if they had a episiotomy or laceration, when it's fixed, it should be approximated. In other words, put together and in a nice line, right? We can use those medications. We can give them ibuprofen is one that seems to help the most. Sometimes they need actual Norco, but usually it's just ibuprofen to help with the inflammation and discomfort. This I wanted to show you up to the right is the use of a donut. I remember when I was in nursing school all these years ago, I was on my OB rotation and I remember this patient was getting ready to go home and she asked the nurse, I was wondering if you could get me a donut before I leave. And I just remember thinking, what a weird request. She wants us to get her a donut from the cafeteria before she leaves. <laughs> and then the nurse brought this in and I just was laughing at myself. But it's super helpful. I usually have the husbands blow it up for them and it just makes it so they can sit in their bottom, especially if it's swollen and stitches and you saw that one that was all bruised up. Then um, it gives them that hole in the middle so it's not putting pressure on there, okay? So return of ovulation and menstruation, we're gonna go over that a little bit more too, but menstrual cycle typically resumes in five weeks if not breastfeeding, eight weeks if breastfeeding without formula supplementation. Return of ovulation is delayed if breastfeeding, and this is, you guys need to know this information right here. Um, but remember, ovulation can occur before menstruation is reestablished, okay? Breastfeeding, no breastfeeding, whatever. If you haven't had a period, you can still get pregnant. So we need to educate our patients about that. Pregnancy is possible. And the ideal spacing should be about two years between children just for your body to heal correctly. And um, the next child has a much better chance. Okay, question. During the postpartum discharge teaching, a woman expresses that since she is breastfeeding her newborn, she will not require birth control. The nurse will what? Inform the physician. Tell the woman she will require birth control when she is weaning the baby. 
inform her that breastfeeding is not a form of birth control, inform her that she must use oral contraceptives and supplement to breastfeeding. So let's break this question down. Why would we inform the physician? There's no need for that right now. We can deal with this question. Tell the woman she will require birth control when she's weaning the baby? No, that's only if she's sexually active and that's up to her if she wants to take the chance. So we don't require birth control. We would suggest it. Inform her that breastfeeding is not a form of birth control. That's absolutely right, it's not. Now, it works for some people, but you cannot count on it. Inform her that she must use oral, oral contraceptives. No, there's other kinds of birth control that people can use besides the pill. So see how we break that question down? I know people are struggling with those types of things, but you had to, on this one, pick the best answer. So here's that Rita that we were talking about. So always check episiotomy, okay, for redness, swelling. So check for edema, ecchymosis, and any kind of abnormal discharge and approximation as it come together, just like we said. So we check the episiotomy, tearing, hematoma formation, and hemorrhoids. And um, act on it if we need to, if there's something wrong. So I wanted you to see this too, the Rita scale again. So the redness, this is a patient who's had their um, perineum repaired. Okay, so at the top, you can see this opening to the vagina. And down below, it's where the stitches have brought it back together. So we don't have much redness. We have just a tiny bit of swelling on the labia. We don't, I don't see any ecchymosis or bruising on this one. Discharge, right now, it sure looks good. You don't see any blood coming out. You don't see anything um, white coming out, anything odd color, and approximation of the wound. It sure looks like it's the tissues are back together correctly. So that's what we assess right there, and especially the doctor, of course. Healing overall takes about six weeks, and that's usually when people resume sexual intercourse. Okay, so breasts. So both nursing and non-nursing mothers experience cha breast changes after birth. So um, for the first two to three days postpartum, breasts are full but soft. Day three, breasts become firm, lumpy due to increased blood flow and milk production. Um, engorged, that's what we try to avoid. They can be gorged for a little bit when the milk first comes in, but this is something we wanna prevent. The engorged breast is hard, erect, and very uncomfortable. The nipple may be so hard that the newborn cannot easily grasp it. The breasts of the non-nursing mother return to their normal size in one to two weeks. But if we do get these engorged breasts, which sometimes it's just swelling, it's not even with milk, we need to never delay breastfeeding if they are engorged. And there's ways to get a baby on with engorged breasts. It's like we pump a little bit off, or we have them stand in the shower and there, we'll talk about that too. I have a whole list of things. Yeah, right here. Massage breasts if achy. Can stand in a warm shower and let the milk come out by itself and just to get them so loose enough so the baby can get on that nipple. And then we can also express small amounts of milk from breasts several times a day. The thing about engorgement is you just gotta be so careful not to over stimulate the breasts. And you guys need to know this, and that should always be part of an assessment if you ever work postpartum. Nipples should be assessed for redness and cracking and washed with plain water. There's cracking, that's the easiest way for bacteria to get in there and cause mastitis. Support bra should be worn, whether it's a breastfeeding mom or someone who's trying to um, dry up their milk. Okay, so um, just one part of teaching that we want to do for non-nursing moms is always avoid stimulation because of the nipples because that stimulates lactation. There, any kind of, even the clothes rubbing against the nipples can cause lactation to happen. So we want to avoid having clothing brush across her breasts. When she's in the shower, she should have her back to the water, the water directly, warm water directly on her breasts 
will loosen it up and, and help milk come out, and we don't want that. We want them to dry up, okay? The nipple should always be washed with plain soap and water because soap, I mean plain water, I'm sorry, because soap can dry them out. So that's important education to give to the patient. Okay, so again, care management after delivery, just to reiterate, this was, um, you see the stars there. I added this slide, so don't worry about what page it's on. So a nursing assessment is per facility protocol. But all mothers, it includes vital signs, fundal location, and consistency and amount of bleeding. Vital signs are taken every 15 minutes during the first hour after delivery. That's pretty much standard of care. Infant may be put to breast and should be within the first hour. And infant is assessed on arrival in the newborn nursery. On the picture on the right, again, is just showing you how to do a fundal check with both sides so you don't have that uterine involution. The doctor you actually, if it's the uterus um, prolapses, the doctor has to take a fist and get it, push it back up in there. The problem is the, the patient can go into shock and the cervix is closing. And think about how tight that cervix is. So they're trying to get this uterus back through that cervix that's trying to close, so it's fighting you. So it can be a horrific day when that happens. And again, I added this just because just be aware, and we go over this in the next chapter um, next week, but just, just to give you a little information, dangers in the immediate postpartum, first 24 hours, hemorrhage. That's why we do all those fundal checks, right? We want to keep an eye on how much bleeding they're doing. Hemorrhage can lead to hypovolemic shock. Infection, think about all the batch exams they may have had during labor and uterine cavity cavity becomes easily accessible to those microorganisms it's open so things come up ascending bacteria and placental attachment site where it detached is an open wound and so that's something that we need to always be careful about we don't want to get infection in in that site okay now we're moving on to changes in the cardiovascular system. We're on page 215, and it's a lot. Cardiovascular, I think I've told you guys before, a lot of women, that's when um, they get diagnosed with cardiac issues is during pregnancy and the first hour after delivery because their heart is very taxed, and if it's not strong, it can show up defects that they didn't know they had. So remember, women lose at least 200 to 500 mils of blood during a vaginal delivery over 500 is considered a postpartum hemorrhage for a vaginal birth. Twice as much is normal during a cesarean, so up to 1,000 mils in a cesarean. Anything over 1,000 is considered a hemorrhage for a C-section. Okay. So despite the blood loss, which is kind of interesting, well, think about we have the the pregnant woman has a tremendous excess of blood during pregnancy just for such an occasion as this. OK, so despite the blood loss, there's temporary increase in blood volume and cardiac output because blood that was directed to the uterus and the placenta returns to the main circulation. Now, added fluid also moves from the tissues into the circulation further increasing blood volume, heart pumps more blood with each contraction, increased stroke volume leading to bradycardia. So after the initial post-birth excitement wanes, the pulse rate may be as low as 50 to 60 beats per minute for about 48 hours of birth. So in other words, you just don't get scared if you see that. Tachycardia is what we get more concerned about. So to reestablish normal fluid balance, the body rids itself of fluids by diuresis. Let's see, I have a slide on that. Let's get to it. And um, diaphoresis. But um, the cardiovascular system, remember, there's a 50% increase in blood volume during pregnancy, coagulation, higher risk of blood clot formation, and um, blood values, H and H diluted due to shifts. I have slides on these too, so we'll get into it more. Chills due to release of pressure on pelvic nerves and a vasomotor response involving epinephrine. So they just have this weird chill and 
I have a slide where we'll talk more about it. Orthostatic hypotension. So it's due to resistance to blood flow in the vessels of the pelvis as it drops. And then nursing care, of course, our vital signs are extremely important to get trending in our home and sign. Okay, so I just want to give you a little review about the home and sign. Um, may occur to venous stasis. It, if present, it may be an early sign of venous thrombosis. Inspect for redness, swelling, and warmth of the leg, right? And report immediately if you have a positive home and sign. Temperature, again, we won't worry about, you know, infection. First 24 hours after delivery, temperature may raise to 100.4. That's usually our limit of what we feel comfortable with. A result, it's a result of dehydration and exertion of labor. Thereafter, temperature should be in the normal range. If temperature is still elevated, infection may have developed and should be reported. And of course, she's having other symptoms, chills, fever, doesn't feel good, things like that. Then of course, the doctor needs to know. And breast engorgement can cause a short-term elevation in temperature. That's usually one of the ways they know they're getting that. Their breast is a little bit red and they spike a fever. Okay, here's that postpartum chill. It's it, this uncontrollable chill and ever, all the family members are always like, she's cold. And I say, and I know it's usually not that. I say, are you cold? And they say, no, I'm just shaking. I'm just shivering. The cause is really kind of unknown, but they think it's related to the nervous response to the vasomotor changes. If chills without fever, there's no clinical significance. It's not infection. But sometimes we do cover the woman with warm blankets just to be on the safe side and reassure the patient and the family that it is normal. Okay, so one more thing on um, blood coagulation. So remember, blood clotting factors are higher during pregnancy and for four to six weeks postpartum. But the woman's ability to break down and eliminate the clots is not increased. Therefore, she's prone to blood clots. And especially if they've had a cesarean because they aren't as active, right? Again, signs of um, any things like blood clots are dyspnea, tachypnea, and those are hallmark signs of uh, pulmonary embolus, okay? And that's something you immediately, of course, report to the doctor. For C-sections, we usually put pneumatic devices on their legs to keep their circulation going well while they're in bed in the very first part, okay? And just wanted to remind you guys that white blood cell count may be rise as high as 12 to 20,000, a level that normally if you looked at a CBC, you'd be like, oh, she's infected, but this is normal in a pregnant woman and someone who has just delivered. It's in response to inflammation, pain, and stress of the delivery and it protects the mother from infection as their tissues heal. The white blood cell count should return to normal by about 12 days postpartum though, okay? Then let's talk a little bit about um, orthostatic hypotension, just mostly that, again, they get a low blood pressure instead of a high. High is never normal, period, in the OB world. Never, never. If you get a question that ever says, High blood pressure is normal. Never, never is it normal. Now they may have had a pre-existing thing or something like that, but it's not normal. Now you can take it and know that the patient just got bad news and is freaked out and you can say, okay, I think it's, you know, she's stressed out, but you retake it to make sure it's coming back down. And some people of course have white coat syndrome. But because of this orthostatic hypertension, we gotta be extremely careful when we get them up we have people faint. Um, thank goodness not too much, but it just happened the other day and usually the nurse is the one to catch them. They think they're fine and then on their way, they start going, they start turning gray and usually I just have them sit right where they are if I see that happening. Okay, so excess fluid, a pulse rate, may tell us that she has excess fluid and um, high pulse rate shows us that they don't have enough fluid, but too much fluid, they might have a low, 
But anyways, diuresis is a, one of the ways they get rid of it, right? Increased excretion of urine. Women may have urinary output as high as 3,000 mils a day. And diaphoresis, they a lot of them per, um, perspire profusely. So they love taking the shower. Then edema in the lower extremities is that body trying to get rid of all that extra fluid. Down in the feet, it can be, it can triple the size after delivery and can be very normal. People get freaked out about it, but it's just your body third spacing getting rid of all that extra fluid. Now, if it's above the waist and a is pissed everywhere, that could mean you have edema in your brain, things like that, and can, you know, can get um, fluid in your lungs, things like that. So we've got to be careful about where the edema is. Okay. So again, this diaphoresis, elimination of excess fluid through the skin, body's way of getting rid of excess fluid accumulated during pregnancy. Profuse diaphoresis occurs most often at night. So they us we usually change their beds every day for them because uh, that's one of the reasons. Okay, changes in the urinary system. I just liked this. This is again one of the extra slides. You see my three little stars there that just a little bit of added information, but we are on page 216 at the bottom. But the changes are loss of muscle tone in the bladder. During labor and delivery, think about where that urethra is in relationship to the vagina where the baby comes out. So it can, um, the urethra and the bladder and surrounding tissue may become edematous or traumatized. Urination can be impeded by anesthetic agents. So we, bladder is another thing. So vital signs in bladder and funduses are our main concern right after a delivery. So urinary output in the early postpartum can, period can be significantly high. They're just diuresing, that's a good thing. Close observation of INO is essential though. Okay, so urinary system. So since they have all this excess fluid, then they, and they get usually boluses during labor of fluid. So lots and lots of fluid can go in and we need to make sure it's coming back out. But part of the problem is, is it can make the bla woman's bladder get full very quickly. And so they may not direct, they may not um, completely empty their bladder each time they get up because of the frequency. So that's something that we have to measure, okay? So kidney function returns to normal within a month after birth. Again, you need to know this, I keep saying it, a full bladder can displace the uterus and lead to postpartum hemorrhage. It does not let that muscle of the uterus clamp down. The woman who avoids frequent small amounts of urine may have increased residual urine because her bladder does not fully empty. Think about that. What have we said? Moist and warm. Residual urine in the bladder may promote the growth of organisms. If patient is unable to void, we provide privacy. We run water in the sink. Sometimes just the sound of running water helps them relax to go pee. Use a peri bottle. We put warm water in these bottles and we spray it over the perineal area to help it relax and warmth and stimulate her to pee. Because you'd be surprised how many women have a hard time peeing after um, delivery. So we don't wanna rush her. I always remain near, but a lot of people have bladder shyness. So I stay outside the door and I say, I'm right here if you need me and let me know when you're done. And sometimes you can also have her place her hands in warm water. There's just the trick. Sometimes I get them in the shower to see if they can just pee while they're relaxing in the shower. So some discomfort also with early urination is expected. Think about if they have, we call them skid marks, where they got enough of a little teeny, teeny, tiny tears down there, but um, it, it's not considered a episiotomy or a laceration we call them skid marks because it didn't go through much layers of the skin, but just like any scrape that we get, it, it burns and especially urine getting on it. So sometimes that happens and um, it's edematous. 
So what we do is um, give them that squirt bottle and tell them to squirt the water while they pee to dilute it so it doesn't sting as bad. But if they have continued frequency and burning and urination, especially if they get a high fever and chills, they could have a kidney infection or a bladder infection and we need to test for that and treat as soon as possible if we are worried about that, okay? All right, gastrointestinal system. It re resumes normal activity shortly after birth, especially when the progesterone starts to decrease. Constipation can be another problem during pregnancy and after delivery. So to help alleviate this problem, we encourage her to increase fluid and fiber intake, just like if you weren't pregnant or had a baby. Increase activity such as walking. Stool softener is usually ordered. We usually give it twice a day, a stool softener. Laxative can be used if needed, and if they don't have a fourth degree, you know, not a, they can use an oral laxative, but not a um, supp uh, suppositories and things. Okay, so lots of times women can be on medication too, and they've had, um, if they've had spinals and and um, fentanyl and things during labor, they that can show para, slow peristalsis. Think about your abdominal muscles. They are all stretched out and make it a little bit harder to do the, you know, clamp down to do the job of pushing down for a bowel movement. Caesarean section aids to the difficulty. Think about that scar and pushing down, it hurts. And um, hemorrhoids or soreness and swelling of the perineum may make her, may make a woman fear. I uh, get that a lot where they say, I don't want you, I'm scared to go. And you just have to give them reassurance and help them, okay? Site dehydration and little food intake during lab labor makes the feces harder which makes total sense. So we need to give them fluids and stool softeners and a healthy diet. So what are signs of a distended bladder in a postpartum woman? So I'm gonna think for a second. So the fundus can be above you, above the umbilicus. It can be to the side push to the side because the uterus is pushing it to the side, right? And you can have um, up above your symphysis, it can be, looks like it's kind of swollen, the bladder is distended. So you look for that too, and you get them to pee. Okay, integumentary system. So one of the parts of that is hyperpigmentation of the skin, the chalasma, that you can see a picture here to the right. Thank goodness in most people it goes away. Some people, I have a friend who's had to get treatments on her skin after having kids, but usually it goes away. The linea nigra disappears, that's that line. See that picture down at the bottom? And that usually goes away. Again, it's the, your melatonin. All these things, pigments of your skin, just have these changes due to um, hormones. And then the striae, you know, the stretch marks. These are not going to ever go away. Now, this one to the right, see the left, they're more red. So she had a baby more recently. To the right, they're a little bit more silverish. So they're healing, but you can't ever get rid of stretch marks unless, of course, you have some sort of plastic surgery or whatever. Um, but the look of them starts to fade, but the stretch mark itself doesn't. Okay, musculoskeletal system. Diactesis recti. I'm going to show you pictures in a minute. It's that longitudinal abdominal muscles that get separated. And the weakness usually remains for about six to eight weeks after delivery and contribute to constipation. Then you have hypermobility of the joints, usually stabilized within six weeks. Remember, there's that relaxin that we have during pregnancy women. And um, that usually stabilizes and joints of the feet may remain separated. That's why some women, after they have children, you hear them say, I went up a shoe size and that stays. So exercises they can do, it's in your book on page 217. I'm not gonna go over them, but just 
you can see abdominal muscle tightening, head lift, pelvic tilt, Kegel exercises. And a woman usually begins light exercises as soon as the first day after a vaginal birth, but after a cesarean, you wait quite a bit longer. So here is what the diastasis recti looks like. So here's just a muscle, a picture on your left of the, see the muscle and there's um, tissue in between. It has totally split to the sides. And to the right, you can see after delivery, what it can look like. The, down to the right, the bottom right, you can totally see those muscles just like this picture on the left that they have split, but they usually go back to normal. But some of these women, poor things, they were so stretched out, the stretch marks and stuff that they get close back to normal, but not always. Okay, the immune system. So, we want to prevent blood incompatibilities and infections. So remember, the RH negative mother should receive a dose of Rogam within 72 hours after giving birth to an RH positive newborn. You've got to know that forever and ever and ever. You need to know that. This um, prevents sensitization to RH positive erythrocytes that may have entered her bloodstream when the newborn was born. Remember, we've talked about this. So just remember, Rogam's given to the mother, not the newborn, and it's an IM injection. Okay, so rubella, German measles, super important. Every woman gets a titer done during pregnancy to see if she's rubella immune. And if she's not, you don't give rubella during pregnancy, only after delivery. Okay, you need to know that. And it's given sub-Q if the titer. Now, I want you to be careful. This is titer less than 1.8. You've got to be careful because every lab does theirs differently. So you've got to see what the norm is for that lab. So in any lab in general, make sure what their norms are. Okay. So vaccine prevents infection with rubella virus during subsequent pregnancies because rubella could cause birth defects if she'd gotten in pregnancy, but should not get pregnant for the month following the vaccination, but it's okay to breastfeed with getting the vaccination. Okay, again, you see star, 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 just some interesting information, adaptation of nursing care. Um, it just had a little bit different than what's in your book, page 218. Um, so after a cesarean, your care is basically the same as a vaginal birth, but you've got to monitor the abdominal dressing. And one thing I'd just like to add, is it ever normal to have a saturated surgical dressing? Never, never, unless the doctor comes and says, yes, I expect bleeding, change it every four hours, things like that, but not on a cesarean. And so, um, that's something that you've got to always, and remember we talked about if you see a dot of blood on there, circle it and make sure it's not growing. Sometimes just a little dot is fine. I'm talking about if you see, if you go in your patient's room and that dressing is saturated with blood, there's a bleed and you've got to act on it. Now I wanted you to look at these pictures too. The top one you can see they used either inside sutures or glue on that incision. And you can see that this was a repeat. See, there was an incision like an inch and a half, almost two inches above this incision. So she had a previous C-section. Our doctors usually take the old scar out and put another one in. I'm not sure what happened on that one. Then on the picture on the bottom is staples. And just doctors just have their preferences of what they use. And um, staples come out before they go home. But with the top one, there's not much you have to do. Sometimes you put steri strips on them. Okay. Now, again, after C-section, the loci is generally less because, again, the uterus has been all cleaned out. They have a catheter for 24 hours after delivery usually. And it should be clear color, not any red. If you have red in the catheter bag, it can be a sign of a nicked bladder. Okay. So... 
respiratory care, they're a little bit more bedridden, and so we've got to be careful with that, and we'll talk more about that. Um, prevention of thrombophlebitis. And um, again, we want to keep them moving, like have them move their legs in bed, things like that, and use those compression devices and get them emulating as soon as possible. Pain management definitely is much more of a challenge after a cesarean than a vaginal birth, but there's all kinds of different things to do, CAD pumps and IV pushes and oral meds, things like that. And I would remember if I were you that the football hold and side lying are preferred positions for breastfeeding after a cesarean, just because it doesn't press on their um, incision. So the other thing I'd like to add about um, cesarean section is there can be a lot of psychosocial stuff to it too. The failure of a natural birth or natural childbirth, experiencing the whole thing. And um, think about this, it says it in your book on page 218 up at the top on the right. Occasionally a woman may feel that she failed if she was unable to give birth after laboring. Terms such as failed induction, and failure to progress imply that the woman herself was not competent in some way. And that's just so true. We use those words so erroneously, we don't even realize what kind of message that can send to the patient. So we need to be careful about how we word things and give the support. And I usually just say things like, I for one am thankful for C-sections. I would have been a statistic back in the old days. My baby and I would have died, so you know I feel like you need to now focus on you. You're healthy, your baby's healthy, and let's just move on from here. But if they need to talk about it, absolutely talk about it, right? Okay, so let's move on to respiratory care. So lung sounds should be auscultated each shift for clarity. More often, if they sound crackly or a little bit. The bases are a little bit, you know, full. So when confined to the bed, instruct the woman to take deep breaths and turn every two hours. Encourage her to cough to move secretions out of lungs. C-section surgical patients don't want to cough because it hurts. So you just teach them to splint their incision and make themselves cough because if they don't, the fluid stays in their lungs and then it can be way worse later. And I try to explain that to them. You get pneumonia, trust me, it's going to be way worse. So incentive spirometers are very useful. I don't know if you guys have used those, but it's just a breathing thing that makes them take deep breaths to um, open up their lungs. So it's very, very helpful and encourage ambulation as soon as possible after delivery. Okay, another question. It is considered normal for a woman's blood pressure to increase during pregnancy, true or false? Hopefully everyone said false because it's never normal for it to increase. You know, I'm not saying one week it's 110 over 70 and the next week it's 120 over 80. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about true higher blood pressures. Okay. So remember for thrombophlebitis that we want to prevent that. So again, the leg exercising, flexing, extending, and... Um, movement. Pain, we talked about that. You can use pain scales. You can use, um, there's all kinds of medications usually ordered, especially after cesarean, of what kind of medications they can take. So emotional care is just about as important as the physical care, if not more. Think about this. The birth of an infant brings about physical changes in the mother, but also causes many emotional and relationship changes in all family members. It's a huge change, usually a looked forward to change, but sometimes you don't realize the effects it's going to have and you have to learn how to deal. So for mothers, the transition to motherhood brings uh, changes in body image, psychological acceptance as a self as a mother figure, doubts about themselves. Can I be a good mother? You know, it, people get scared. So this um, guy named Ruben did the psychological adaptation thing, and it's on table 9-2 on page 221. 
and you guys need to know the different phases. You need to know what each one is and when, okay? So um, this Reuben has described three of these phases and in a more recent study shows that women progress through the same three phases, although though at a more rapid pace than originally thought, okay? So um, be sure and study that, you guys. Postpartum blues. It's just a normal thing. Like you look down, the woman looks down at her baby and is like, boo, hoo, hoo, but she's like happy. It's just these weird em uh, emotions that usually are very hormonally based. But what it really comes down to is it's conflicting feelings of joy and emotional letdown. All these months you've led up to this and now it's happened and just so much has changed and different and so it's just conflicting emotions and um, we have to be prepared for that because we certainly don't want it to ever go to depression or psychoses. Postpartum blues, I tell people, it just can be very normal, but I really grow over the differences between and we get into that more later. I think it's the next chapter with blues and psychoses and um, depression but a little bit about depression right now is that it's a persistent mood of unhappiness and the nurse should explain that persistent depression is not expected and should be reported to her healthcare provider i've had many people come back because i do that i really really talk about that on my discharge teaching and they come back and give me feedback that they were so glad that i went over that with them it's it's becoming a big deal these days that too many women are getting postpartum depression and so um, they need to know what to do about it. And I tell them, call their doctor. It's a temporary thing usually that they need to, it's a chemical imbalance that they need to get their body back in keel, in an even keel, okay? And then of course, fatigue. Oh man, think about that. Today, with today's modern lifestyles, it often requires a woman to work through most of her pregnancy, room in after the delivery with the responsibility of the newborn the whole time they're there, with all this baby friendly stuff, then return home after delivery in 48 hours or so to now all your home responsibilities and taking care of a baby and ha up half the night feeding it. So fatigue is huge. And think about us not even being pregnant, male, female, whoever we are, how when we get tired, how we don't have our coping skills as well usually. So um, the nurse should assess the level of maternal fatigue and initiate appropriate relief measures, such as taking on the care of the newborn for a few hours. I do that. I Sometimes I say, you need a nap. You're exhausted. Let me take the baby. And I just kind of tease with them. And I say, we make really good babysitters. And they say, I feel guilty. And no reason to feel guilty. You're going to be a better mom if you go home with rest. So we need to do that for them. Okay. Okay, again, the blues usually caused by conflicting feelings of joy and emotional letdown. 70% of women experience this. Generally starts a few days after birth and lasts around 10 days. Characterized by tearfulness, insomnia, lack of appetite, feeling of being disappointed. That's just the typical postpartum blues. And then again, people usually snap out of it. Parenthood. It can affect a lot of things in relationships and family dynamics, it can affect communication between partners. The division of responsibility can be a source of conflict. Okay, I feel like I've been home with a screaming baby all day. You should go in and do the dishes. And the significant other may say, um, I've been at my job all day and I should come home to a nice clean house because you've been home all day. Things like that, you can see how that happens. And that, that can be super hard. Fatigue increases irritability. Loss of freedom and decreased socializing may cause people to feel lonely. It's, it's a different world once you become a parent. You don't have that freedom. Okay, fathers. So fathers go through periods of adjustment too. One of the things they go through is this engrossment where they have this intense interest in their newborn. And it's super cool to watch sometimes. They just hold their baby and look at it and talk to it and just fall in love. There's four phases of adjustment for fathers too. So having expectations and personal intentions, confronting reality and overcoming frustrations, creating one's own personal father role 
and reaping rewards of fatherhood. But adjusting all that sometimes um, can be hard. So we need to include fathers in the care as much as possible and instruct them. I always call it like blanket wrapping 101 and diaper changing 101 that, you know, get those fathers doing that stuff. Partner bonding. Again, this isn't in your book. This is just one I added. They should be included in all the teaching sessions, care and feeding. Some don't want to. Some say, I don't want to. She's going to be doing this or whatever. But you try to get them engaged. Bonding begins prenatally when father or partner feels the fetus move or hears the heartbeat. They oftentimes talk to the belly, right? Engrossment is shown by holding, studying, and touching the infant. Adjustment transition occur when the partner is able to increase interaction with the newborn. So it's important for us to encourage dads. I go plop the baby in the dad's arms lots of times and say, here, whether they want to or not. And then they usually are pretty tickled. A lot of them are just scared. They think the baby is so fragile. Siblings can be good or bad. Depends on the age and their development. Younger siblings may consider newborn as competition and that can get a little ugly may see behavior such as regression. They might have been potty trained and now they want to pee in a diaper just like the baby is. Jealousy, you're spending all this time. I remember my son was the oldest one and he used to say to me, mommy, can you put Tessa in her room? I don't want her out here anymore. It's like, you can't put a little toddler in her room by herself. <laughs> Anyways, so special time should be set aside for parents to give to older siblings. It's, it's just important how you handle the situation. We've had toddlers come in. We had one that the mom warned me. She goes, you watch, it's going to be ugly. And they brought him in, the dad did, and the mom was holding the baby. The the little boy just looked at the mom, looked at the baby, gave a dirty look, turned his head and said to the dad, I want to go home. He wanted no part of it. And the mom just looked at me and said, see, I told you. She goes, uh, we're in for a interesting few months here. Okay, so grandparent involvement. So level of involvement, of course, depends on proximity. Like I have grandkids down in Pismo that I hardly ever get to see. I'm close to a few of them and the other ones hardly even know, the little ones hardly even know who I am, right? I have two local ones that I see all the time and babysit and sleepovers and just makes a huge difference, of course. Um, parenting practices change from one generation to the next. So there may be disapproval that you're not doing raising your child the same way they think you should. Maybe conflict in, because of different child rearing practices. Um, attend, attending grandparenting classes is encouraged. They can be given pointers on, you know, don't be too involved and don't be too overbearing, right? Now grieving parents, we're going to get sad for a minute here, but it's a fact of life in the OB world. I hate that we have to talk about this, but it's a fact. You know, the postpartum is usually supposed to be a joyful time, but sometimes we get grieving parents. And most of these parents, of course, we need to listen to them, support them, give them options of how do they want to do things. Some people, you know, because usually you have to induce and sometimes they can wait till their body takes over. But, um, you know, lots of times they come in with decreased fetal movement and we don't find a heartbeat or they've gone for an ultrasound or they've gone to the doctor's office and they can't find a heartbeat. And um, one that stands out in my mind, she had a little boy at home and she came in and she goes, you know, I was just at work and it just didn't feel like the baby was moving as much. I think I'm just being ridiculous. I'm overreacting, but I just wanted to make sure. I put her on the monitor and I couldn't find a heartbeat, couldn't find a heartbeat, couldn't find a heartbeat. And I wanted the doctor to come over and do a bedside ultrasound fast so she'd have an answer. And he couldn't, he was stuck in surgery. So I took her downstairs to the ultrasound radiology department. And what's hard is the tech can't tell them anything. So we're in there and I knew this patient and she was super sweet and um, I saw no heartbeat. I, the tech put the ultrasound right over the fetal heart and it wasn't beating. 
and the patient's just looking at me frantically tell like tell me tell me please just tell me and um, the tech can't she could lose her job but I just said an observation as an OB nurse I said I didn't see a heart beating the doctor still has to confirm and you know but the baby was gone and of course she immediately got hysterical she was like 35 weeks really really awful and um, so she called her husband then we took her upstairs to induce her and so you go through this of course you go through they go through shock and disbelief she st she kept saying it was nothing it was nothing this just this can't be true and she kept saying can you do something else to make sure you know things like that and you know then of course they get anger guilt did I do something wrong is there something I did in my pregnancy that I did wrong sadness and depression of course but gradual resolution of the sadness you know they have to deal so um they may ask questions about what they could have done differently and they may wish to have you know a priest there or a pastor there things like that we need to i usually ask those things is there anyone you want with you is there anyone we can call and you know if the newborn dies is stillborn or has a birth defect the parents reactions depend on whether the event was expected to of course you know if they came from the office for an induction of labor already knowing they went home and got their clothes and stuff they already knew but if they come in and just boom all of a sudden they're told their baby's gone that's devastating so parents should be prepared for the newborn's appearance after the delivery it depends on how far gone how long it's been if there's any breakdown of the tissue sometimes they come out and they're just macerated sometimes they come out and they look like they should be breathing they're so perfect so but for the ones that the skin is already sloughing and they look like odd little things you prepare the parents and you cover up their bodies as much as possible you put them in I have a picture I'll show you let's see on the next one right here this is a picture of a demise so I personally I try to make the bug baby snugly and warm and you know the heads can look a little funny and you can see on the hands they're a little bit peely there and who knows what the body look like but um, you and see how purple the lips are things like that but you try to make them as beautiful for that memory as possible and on the left we did this for a family they had a demise and they knew it was a demise when they came in and they told me a lot of people got them these things so I don't know if you can tell but this is an imprint it's the feet are sticking out it was this really neat kit and my friend and I Carol one of the other nurses we did that for her um, we did all these little kits for her so that she wouldn't have to do them but that she'd have these keepsakes and what a neat idea your little baby's feet right there you see all the toes and the wrinkles on the bottom of their feet this one was same baby and it was a kit on the left I just wanted you to see how you see the hand emerging it was a very interesting way that this kit was and you just let it dry and you started peeling off the outside coating and the hand starts to emerge and then this is the final product and we were just getting the little finishing touches but how amazing that is her baby's fingers and hand and just she wanted these keepsakes the other thing we do is um, memory boxes so if the baby has enough hair we cut some hair so that and put it in a little envelope that's there or tape it on the, a little card we get handprints and footprints we get pictures we put their um, identification bands on them and this box just like has how to grieve it has a book in there you know about grieving and it has a little poem and um, the little blanket that we wrapped around them we put in here it's just this little keepsake box 
and you close it up and it has a pretty little ribbon that it closes with for them to keep as a keepsake for their baby. So those are, that's one of the absolute hardest part of my job, of course, is these fetal demises. And just remember that everyone grieves in different ways. So we need to listen to these patients' responses and determine the level of support that's needed. Answer any question they have. Give them privacy. Give them time with these babies. I had one that they absolutely were convinced that they didn't want to hold the baby afterwards, neither the mom or the dad. They didn't want to see it. And I just sat down with them and I said, I respect whatever decision you make. It's your decision. But I got to tell you, I've taken many classes on this and dealt with this too many times to <laughs> that, that you'd ever want. And um, I said, I have found in my experience and in studies that have been done that people do way better if they held their baby or at least looked at their baby. And I can tell you this, so they finally decided they were gonna hold the baby. Once they do, they never wanna let it go. But it's, believe it or not, it's healthy for the grieving process. And you say things like your baby is beautiful. You made a beautiful baby. Look at this precious little baby girl, things like that. It's still their baby. So you have to say positives too, not just, oh, you know, and you can't say, and of course, I think you guys have read enough and been in school long enough now to know you never say things. Oh, well, you can have another one. Or, you know what, at least it wasn't your first. Or, you know what, um, he's in a better place. Those are not ever things people want to hear. But um, you should tell them the expectations, what's going to happen, if it's going to go to, if it's below 20 weeks, the the baby goes to pathology. If it's over 20 weeks, it goes to the, um, at our, in our town, it's Terzich and Wilson, it's a funeral home. And they usually take care of everything for free for our patients that have this happen to them. They're very generous and very wonderful. Okay, and also the one thing to be super careful about is other people coming in, lab people. We we put a big sign on their door that says, you know, so that it's a sign that it's a fetal demise. Because we've had it where people didn't see the sign or whatever, walk in and go, oh, where's your baby? Do you have a boy or a girl? You know, all happy. And they're like, oh, my baby's dead. And can you, can, can you imagine what a horrible, awkward situation for everybody? So we try to make it get known to everybody that there is a demise in there so that those kinds of things don't happen. Okay, moving on. Family care plan, we're on page 223. It's a care plan similar to the traditional nursing care plan, except that the patient is the entire family rather than the woman in the hospital, okay? So what you need to do is get data collection for the family care plan. Demographics, where do they live? How far away do they have what they need for the baby? Family composition, is there 20 people that live in one house? Is it a mom and a dad who have no support? Does it have running water? What, you know, what kind of home is it? What is their occupation to help with what's safe, what's not, when to go back to work, what kind of cultural group, um, is there anything we need to do for that culture, religious, spiritual affiliation, do they want a baptism before the baby goes home, things like that, developmental tasks, um, health concerns, you can read these, communication patterns, decision making, family values, socialization, anyways, just to make the, the care plan for the family, not just the patient. Okay, now we're going to move on to the objectives. Okay, so you can see the objectives here. We're going to get into newborn complications and assessment and things of the um, newborns and breastfeeding. Dietary needs of the mother, breast pumps, things like that. Okay. All right. Okay, so we're on phase two, care of the newborn. So, of course, what we're going to want to do immediately after they're born is observed for injuries or anomalies. Remember we talked about just immediately anything that's grossly norm, abnormal. 
obtain vital signs, weighing and measuring length and head circumference of the newborn, umbilical cord care. So we want to do the AVA. So remember, there's two arteries and one vein in an umbilical cord. We talked about that before, AVA. Two vessel cord, which I'm going to show you a picture in a minute, can be associated with other internal anomalies such as GU issues or GI, gentle urinary, gentle intestinal. Diaper should be fastened below umbilical cord to allow for air circulation. Those are all things that you need to remember when dealing with the cord and screening tests, but we talked already about that. That's talking things like um, PKUs and, you know, those um, state mandated tests that I I told you about. Okay, so neonatal transition to extra uterine life. You can look at those on page 224. You can just read about what the phase one, phase two, phase three is. Just it's um, transition to life for a newborn. Phase two, care of the newborn. So we want to always support thermal regulation. We've talked and talked about how they can lose heat very, heat very easily, especially through their scalp. So that's very important for us to um, not have, you know, with conduction, convection, radiation, so not near cold surfaces, no drafts. You want to put them on a warmed isolate or a warmed mama, not a cold isolate. Evaporation. Newborns lose heat. You need to know this quickly after birth as fluid evaporates from their bodies due to evaporation of the amniotic fluid okay that's why we dry them fast and then um, put them skin to skin or whatever we're going to do wrap them up we always want to observe bowel and urinary function we always put id bands on the mother and the baby the baby usually has two the mother has one okay so the newborns are you about the urination let's see yeah urinary function just know that babies can go for as long as 24 hours without avoiding sometimes up to 48 hours but that starts getting a little nerve-wracking what's going on with those kidneys right is it shunting remember i told you we had that one that my friend was just waiting for the baby to be um to pee to go home and baby turned gray and that's the one that had the cardiac defect so think about critical think this when that newborn's body was trying to shunt it, it with a cardiac defect like that it wasn't able to pump as much much oxygenated blood so what did that little baby do it shunted away from its unimportant organs which to a newborn kidneys are not an essential organ their brain is their adrenals are and their heart is so that's where they're going to shunt the blood to. So if they're if the kidney's not getting well oxygenated, they're not going to avoid. So you got to think about all the reasons why and what we do about it. Okay. Um, seventy percent of term newborns pass meconium in the first twelve hours. Sometimes again that takes up to twenty four hours, but usually it is within the first twelve hours, especially if they're eating at all. Okay. So identifying the infant. We're going to do gestational age, you know, with the Ballard scale. We are going to check their skin for vernix. That can tell us if they have a lot of vernix. They're probably not term babies. If they have almost no vernix, they're term. Do they have hair? Ear? Where are their ears? Where are they set? Are they low set ears? Breast tissue? How much do they have? Genitalia? Do they have descended testes? Things like that soul creases remember we said smooth flat soles of the feet can be preterm and when they have the um, wrinkles all the way up then that's usually a term or post-term baby so this is what i wanted to show you with the umbilical cord so up on the left you can see the umbilical cord attached to the placenta okay so then when the baby comes out of course we clamp and cut the cord and this is exactly what we should see on the right. We should see the three vessels, those three holes, okay? And on the bottom picture, it's showing two vessels. And that can be a sign of an anomaly somewhere in the body. Not always. Babies can be totally normal with two vessels, but you have to do further investigation if they only have two. 
So again, a quick check is made to detect any gross abnormality and, and the baby is dried and wrapped with a warm towel and then placed on mom's arm, on chest or dad's or whatever the case may be. And then of course we put ID bands on and we use the security bands that ours are called hugs. They're called different things depending on the system you have. And ours, we put it on the ankle and it does a little beep when it connects and the computer, it shows up out there and then you put the baby's name in there. And if anybody cuts it or goes too near a door or a window or it gets too loose and doesn't have contact anymore, then it alarms and everybody knows about it. Also with the ID bands, when you take it, say you took a baby out for a blood test or something, every time you take it back to mama, you should be checking those ID bands that the number you look or read moms and the babies. I always show them, I say, okay, see yours and see this one, it's six two blah, blah, blah. And that yours is six two blah, 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 for them to see that it's their baby, okay? So they should um, try to recognize employees, you know, the, if there's a lot of new employees going through, like at our hospital, a lot of, and a lot of hospitals I know of, we have a regular ID band, but then we have a color on ours that is, I think ours is green, it used to be pink, and nobody else in the hospital has that on their band. So we educate our patients when they get admitted, okay, nobody should be taking your baby to do anything unless they have one of these bands or badges with a picture on it and this color. And, um, you know, don't leave your baby unattended in your room, things like that. Then, um, let's see what else. We talked about gestational age, all that good stuff. Oh, and when checking for the anomalies, the quick assessment, you wanna look to see if everything is symmetrical. When they cry, are both arms moving, both legs moving? Is one side of the face staying still and the other moving? You wanna look for symmetry and equality of movement, okay? And especially if things like forceps or vacuums were used. Of course, the obvious anomalies, spina bifida and cleft lip and things, you notice those immediately. The feet should be observed for straightness or to determine if they're deviated or if they can be put to a straight position, you know, the club foot. And of course we do um, frequent vital signs. They're measured every 15 to 30 minutes. We're on page 227. I got a little ahead of myself getting to the, um, I wish I, I've got to learn how to go back on this. I've tried it and it just doesn't work. Anyways, obtaining vital signs and respiratory rate. Remember their respiratory rate normal is 30 to 60. And right after birth, you do heart rate and respiratory rate for one minute. Then after that, you can go to um, 15 seconds. But their initial one, you should do times one minute. Okay. And um, remember the normal heart rate is 110 to 160. Temperature, we always do an axillary temperature. Rarely, rarely do we have anybody do a rectal unless we really need to know just because it can be so damaging. Blood pressure, we usually only do a blood pressure if we're concerned about a cardiac issue or if they had vacuum extraction delivery where we're worried about any kind of um, pressure in their brain. So there's, you should see all the sizes, these teeny tiny little blood pressure cuffs. Sometimes you do all four extremities to see if there's a big difference in, you know, pre-ductal, pre post-ductal, things like that. It helps you know about the heart. And the normal range of blood pressure is um, between 65 and 95 systolic, and 30 to 60 diastolic, okay? We always weigh and measure the babies. We try to do that in the patient's room if we possibly can. We have a portable scale and it's measure, measured in grams for gestational age assessment and recorded in kilograms. And that's what, the reason why it's recorded in kilograms is if the babies need any medications, that's how they um, dose it by how much the baby weighs, okay? So length, you know, you some like us, we have a paper tape taped on our scale. And so we just put the baby's head at the top and put your hand there to go over to the, the tape and then pull, 
babies, it's hard to straighten their legs. It's really hard, but you straighten their leg and find out where that number is. And then, you know, of course, that's their length. Notice, note where the heel ends. Head circumference is important because you can catch microcephaly. You know, if it's 11 inch head and it's a nine pound baby, something might be wrong. Can you, where you measure that is the fullest part of the newborn's head is just above the eyebrows. And chest circumference is um, at the nipple line. Some hospitals do abdominal, but most just do head and chest. Okay. And then cord clamping. The most hospitals now do delayed cord clamping for 30 to 60 seconds after birth, or some of our doctors do it when it stops pulsing. They'll cut it then. And it provides better newborn outcome due to increased iron stores provided to the newborn. Okay. And then again, we look at the number of vessels. Okay, I think this is in the discharge sheet, but I'm going to review it a little bit because you need to know um, this for testing purposes. The diaper should be fastened low below the cord to allow air circulation, and the cord should become dry and brownish black as it dries. The clamp is removed when the end of the cord is dry and crisp, usually within about 24 hours. Parents are, report, are taught to report redness of the area or a moist foul smelling umbilical cord. Many parents prefer to give sponge baths for the first week or until the cord stump falls off. The tub baths are safe, but it, you, most doctors just prefer it if you just wait till that cord is dried and falled off, fallen off. So just give sponge baths, okay? And um, bleeding from the cord during the first few hours usually indicates just that the clamp loosened up a little bit and that you need to either put a new one on or tighten that if you can. But you've got to be careful because babies don't have a lot of blood to begin with. Okay. All right. Now let's move on to hypoglycemia. So we've already talked a little bit about this, but for this chapter and testing purposes, just remember blood glucose below 40 in the term infant indicates hypoglycemia. And remember, the brain is totally dependent on a steady supply of glucose for its metabolism. That's why blood sugars are super important in newborns. And until newborns begin regular feedings, they must use the glucose stored in their bodies. Well, what if you have a skinny little baby that doesn't have any storage? Then that baby's going to get hypoglycemic pretty darn quick. So risks for neonatal hypoglycemia, and I think this was an extra slide too. Um, probably should have a star, star, star. But anyways, preterm and postterm babies, diabetic mother, large baby, LGA, large for gestational age, small for gestational age babies, intrauterine growth restricted babies, babies that were asphyxiated at birth, cold stress, and or mother had tocolytics during the labor process like terbutaline. For some reason, that affects their blood sugar. Signs and symptoms. I would know these. I would memorize these. Signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia. And if it's not on this list on your quiz, then don't pick it. Or if it's the wrong one, pick it. But you should know what the signs and symptoms are. Jitteriness, poor muscle tone, sweating, respiratory difficulty, low temperature, poor suck, high-pitched cry, lethargy, seizure, okay? And jitteriness, we're gonna to try to put a video up of um, low blood sugar babies for you for to look at. And um, so you can see what it looks like. Okay, and remember the high-pitched cry can be neuro-involvement. So now we are at skin care. Wait, yeah, skin care. So just remember when the um, baby's condition is stable, we're on page 229 right now, the baby's blood should be washed off in the amniotic fluid that may be present on the newborn skin, but we do not want to be vigorous about removing that vernix because it's very good for their skins and you should leave it in the creases. It's very, very good for them. Okay, here we go, promoting bonding and attachment. Bonding, strong emotional tie that forms soon after birth between parents and the newborn. 
Attachment is affectionate tie occurring over time with increased interaction. We need to learn infants communication cues. It's interesting, you, you can get so you can just tell what's wrong with that baby. I can walk in a room and the parents are trying to put it to breast or doing this or doing that. And I can say, you know what? That's hunger, baby's trying to get, eat its anything in sight. You know, you hold it and it tries to eat your shoulder. And they'll say, well, I just fed the baby. Well, I have a feeling that maybe the baby wasn't latched on correctly and didn't get much and is still hungry and frustrated. Or if it's this strong cry and their little knees are being drawn up, that's pain. That's, you know, they've got either gas or they've got a burp in there that needs to come out. So I teach parents, you know, you need to learn your baby's language. What cry means what? And when siblings, they get upset when the baby cries. And I always say to them, if they're old enough to understand, this is the way your baby sister talks to you. And that's how they know how to talk. They don't talk any other way. And so we just need to listen to that. And that actually makes the little kids feel better because a lot of them get very upset. And one of them, like I was holding the baby for a minute, comes over to me and looks up at me and says, you can't take my baby. I said, oh, sweetie, I'm not. I'm just listening to your baby. I promise you, I'm not taking your baby away from you. Some of them are just, that's one of my absolute favorite parts of my job is when the siblings get to come in and meet the baby. And I go take them and get crackers and we give them big sister or big brother stickers and things like that. It's, it can be a lot of fun. Okay. So again, need to learn the communication cues and um, nursing assessments should, um, should include observing for these to occur. So we want bonding. We had one baby, I might've told you about this mom that the nurses were extremely concerned about that one of them, the nurses was walking down the hall and was noticed, glanced in the door, heard her raise the mother, raising the voice to the baby. And she was trying to feed the baby a bottle and said, you better eat this baby, damn it. Just mean like, oh, like shoving the bottle in the newborn's mouth and stuff. and. That's the one later we found out had died. So you know what? We need to watch for this bonding and attachment. And if it if it's not going as it should, we need to get social workers in there. You know, a lot of people in hospitals think, oh, the social worker, or they're going to get me in trouble with CWS, things like that. Well, not if you're not doing anything wrong. They're also there as a resource and to help you find resources or groups or people to talk to or, you know, just support Okay, so, you know, for some people, parental feelings don't come naturally. Some people haven't been around kids hardly in their life. So difficulty in bonding, rejection, or indifference in one or both parents should be recorded and, again, referred somewhere because what's going to happen when they take this baby home? So nursing interventions to aid in bonding and attachment. So call the infant by name, which we I love to do that. I think it's fun to call him by name. Holding the infant in face, that just means face to face. Providing skin to skin contact, talk in gentle, high pitched tones. Babies listen, they stare, they look, they try to mimic your, your talking. It can be so cute. Okay, here's another one that I put in here, promoting it. Bonding and attachment processes produce affectionate and emotional commitment between two individuals. So touch is important and voice pitch. A high one causes the infant to become more alert and turn toward the voice and it progresses over time. So discharge teaching, I just wanted to throw this in there that there's many ways. We have a channel at our hospital that some of our nurses years ago made a video and of um, education. And so it runs on channel four on the TVs every day. It's in a loop. So they can watch it in, um, every hour. It starts again, I think. Anyways, or you can have a video DVD. We give pamphlets. We have them do return demonstrations. We get them consultants if we need to. La Leche League is out there for help with breastfeeding. If we have, um, um, oh, breast um, lactation consultants, things like that. Okay, on to breastfeeding. A huge topic in and of itself. 
And um, so let's move on. So, of course, nutrition is especially important in the first few months of life because the brain grows rapidly in a newborn, right? Energy use is high because of the newborn's rapid growth. So there's so many things to breastfeeding. The first is the decision whether to breastfeed or not. Physiology of lactation, hormonal stimulation, the prolactin and oxytocin. There's the composition of the milk for breastfeeding, four milk and hind milk. Four milk is the watery stuff that comes out first that quenches baby's thirst, but it doesn't necessarily satisfy hunger. Hind milk is the later milk. It has the higher fat content and it helps satisfy infant's hunger, but baby has to breastfeed longer to get that hind milk. And that's why babies that um, wake up to nurse every hour, lots of times it's because they didn't nurse long enough or hard enough, strong enough to get that hind milk, okay? So there's phases in milk production, colostrum, transitional and mature, which we'll go over. There's a picture here that you can see on the left, we call liquid gold colostrum. You can see it's a goldy color and breast milk, which is also amazing, of course. Supplemental feedings of formula or water should not be offered to a healthy newborn who is breastfeeding. There's no need to add that into the equation. So this is just showing on the left-hand side a baby that looks like she just had a C-section laying flat and how babies can, can breastfeed in all kinds of different positions and ways, and it works. Then on the right, one hour following the complete delivery of the baby, the baby should be fed. They just feel that that's the best time to get the baby, that they're usually alert and I'm ready to nurse. Now remember, breastfed babies don't get that, I mean, um, C-section babies don't get that squeeze. So remember we talked about they're filled with fluid a lot, so they don't often feel hungry. So breastfeeding, or so sorry, C-section babies don't always um, want to eat in the beginning, and that's just very normal for them. Advantage of breastfeeding, promotes mother-infant bonding, maintains infant temperature, sucking stimulates oxytocin to release to contract mother's uterus. Again, a great way for mom not to bleed too much. Instruct the mother to alternate breasts when feeding. And then there's this cultural use of galactagogs. And um, so their breast milk stimulators, a lot of them, some people just can be cultural too, just beer, rice, gruel, fenugreek tea is for people who need to produce more milk, sesame tea. There's all kinds of things out there that women try and use. And just remember with um, why other advantages of breastfeeding on page 231, that no Commercial formula has the exact nutritional composition of breast milk. They've just found that breast milk is just made for what the baby needs. It contains a full range of nutrients. Breast milk is easily digested by the newborn's maturing digestive system. Doesn't cause newborn allergies. Provides natural immunity because the mother transfers antibodies through the milk. Colostrum is particularly high. So as I've said before, even if we can just get colostrum for a couple of days in them, that's incredible. Um, it promotes elimination of meconium. Breastfed newborns are rarely constipated. Suckling at the best promotes mouth development. It's convenient and economical. It eliminates the risk of contaminated water supply or improper dilution of the um, formula. And um, newborn suckling promotes return of the uterus to its pre-pregnant state. It may help play a significant role in improving brain development in a newborn. Breast milk production uses maternal fat stores, which facilitates maternal weight loss. Breastfeeding enhances a close mother-child relationship and may reduce the occurrence of childhood respiratory disorders and diabetes in the infant. They feel that also sucking on a fake nipple versus mom's nipple, it, the eustachian tubes are used differently. And that's why a lot of breast-fed um, babies don't get the ear infections that a lot of bottle-fed babies are. Okay. Infectious diseases and breastfeeding. So the only absolute contraindications to breastfeeding is an infection with HIV and of course the um, actual AIDS virus, okay? Both can be transmitted via breast milk 
if mother has hepatitis C with liver failure, breastfeeding is also contraindicated. Also, a mother should breastfeed if she has an active um, herpes simplex virus, so or varicella zoster virus like um, shingles. Breastfeeding is contraindicated until the lesions on her breasts have all healed. So she can have it on her lip, just not on her breasts. Mothers with pulmonary tuberculosis must be isolated from their newborn infant, but can pump breasts so that their infant can still receive the milk. They just shouldn't be exposed to the mom, you know, the TB and the coughing and things like that. And there's other drugs that um, if mothers are using that babies shouldn't breastfeed, but that's a that's a conversation with the doctor. OK, yeah, some psychotropic drugs and some drugs to treat migraines, they are contraindicated. They pass through the breast milk. Nurses mothers should continue to avoid eating fish containing high levels of mercury because that will pass through the breast milk. Galactosemia in the infant is a contraindication to breastfeeding. And then, of course, narcotic sedatives. I think I have this on here. Oh, yeah, yeah um, no contraindication to any vaccine with the exception of smallpox vaccine. Okay. So, There are drugs like narcotic sedatives, anticonvulsives, antihistamines, decongestants, antihypertensive, antimicrobials, and coffee intake are all considered generally safe. It just depends on what they are and how much. You can take antihistamines, just know that that's a drying agent and can dry milk up some. So, you know, I think they're talking moderation here, okay? So physiology of lactation. So prolactin, from the anterior pituitary gland causes the production and ejection of breast milk. Oxytocin from the posterior pituitary gland triggers milk ejection when the infant sucks on the nipple, causes the milk to be delivered from the alveoli through the duct system to the nipple, and that causes milk ejection or that letdown reflex that women feel. They all of a sudden feel this, ooh, it's not quite painful, but it's just this letdown of the milk filling up their breasts also stimulates uterine contractions. So um, during pregnancy, the glandular tissues of the breast grow under the influences of several hormones. And they, it, it, women also secrete high levels of prolactin, which is a hormone that causes breast pr production. If milk is not removed from the breast, prolactin secretion abates and the breasts return to their pre-pregnant state. That's why it's important if a baby is in the nursery and can't eat or anything, it's important to get the mom pumping to get those breasts stimulated. Newborn suckling at the breast stimulate the release of oxytocin, like we said. And um, we talked about the foremilk and the hind milk. Okay, and now we're on 232 down on the bottom. So there's three types produced um, during the establishment of lactation, colostrum, transitional milk, and mature milk. Okay, so you can see how it goes from that orange, orange, orange color to color to the whitish. Sometimes it can have a green hue, blue hue. It just depends on the patient or the mom. And, um, but it's all good stuff for that baby. So late in pregnancy and for the few state for first few days after birth, it's the colostrum that is secreted in the breast. This yellow is fluid is rich in protective antibodies. It provides protein, vitamins A and E, and essential minerals, but it's lower in calories than milk. It has a laxative effect which aids in eliminating meconium. See why that, just that first, see that three days it says postpartum, that's awesome. If we could even, if moms just could only just do that, it would be so helpful for that baby. Okay, then here's colostrum again, produced for the first three or four days postpartum. We talked about the antibodies, it's low in sugar and fat, easy to digest, rich in immunoglobulin, helps establish normal intestinal flora. They have done studies that show a huge difference in a baby's gut if they get this colostrum in to close off that gut. Laxative effect speeds passage of meconium. Transitional milk lasts between the fifth day and two weeks. Composition of milk changes, lactose, fat, and calories increase. Then we get to the mature milk. It looks similar to skim milk. It can, like I said, bluish or greenish. 
causes some mothers to question whether their milk is rich enough to support their baby, but it is. It is made for a newborn, of course. Mature milk contains approximately 22.5 kcals per ounce and is just right to meet the needs of the infant. So composition of breast milk. Protein is lower than in formulas. Greater proportion of calories from carbs in form of lactose. More fat present in the hind milk. Contains enzymes that aid in digestion. Fluoride is present if the mother drinks fluoridated water. That was just an extra one. Remember a little tidbit there. Immune protection in breast milk. Protects against several bacterial and viral diseases. Lactoferrin plays a part in controlling bacterial growth in the GI tract. Immunoglobulin A protects against development of many allergies. Contains long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids and amino acids that promote eye and neurologic development. I already gave you that list. Okay, initiating breastfeeding. Ideal is within the first hour. What's important is to help position with positioning with the mother if she's been if she's had surgery or something that makes it a little bit more difficult. But um, we can get that baby up on that breast in almost any position. Stimulate the rooting reflex of the infant, which we'll look on later, and the latch on technique. Okay, it's very important to recognize hunger in the newborn. So the things you watch for, look at this baby's hand in its mouth. It's looking for something to eat, right? So hand to mouth movements, mouth and tongue movements. They can start just like, almost look like they're licking their lips. Sucking motions, rooting movements. Seriously, some babies you pick up, they're eating your shoulder, your chin. They're sucking on anything they can get their mouth near. So rooting and clenched fists. Oh, I'm mad. I'm hungry. Help me. Get me food. Kicking of the legs. It's like, is anybody going to hear me right now? I want to eat. Crying is a late sign. We need to recognize the rooting and sucking motions before we um, let them get too hungry. So here's some positions for breastfeeding. The one A is my favorite to help patients. And see how the baby's tummy to tummy. Too many people have their babies rolled out and that gets the mom's breast sore. It pulls on them wrong, gets them um, chapped. So it's important that cross cradle to really have that kind of positioning. Then the second one is the football hold. You can see that the baby is, um, the little legs are to the back of the chair underneath the mom's armpit. And a lot of people feel like they have more control over it in that position. And then the right is just a um, sideline type thing. I think they're just calling this a true sideline position. And that's really a good one for C-section moms. Correct positioning, okay. So, you know, a lot of people think Okay, come in, have the baby, put the baby to breast, baby eats, we go home. Breastfeeding can be very difficult and challenging for people. And that's what our role is, is to help with all this. And what, my, what I say to my patients is, I want you to be successful at this. And I'm going to do everything to make you successful before you go home at breastfeeding. So for the feeding to occur, consider that we need to have alignment of both mother and the baby. And like I showed you that nice tummy to tummy on that other picture. Position in which mother holds newborn. Hand position for supporting breasts. Newborn's mouth, lip, and tongue position. So of course, mouth open, lips flanged, tongue below the nipple. Place the areola well into the baby's mouth as this action compresses the milk sinuses beneath the areola and draws milk into the baby's mouth during sucking. Okay, so positions of the mother's hands is very important. And um, sometimes they have a tendency to get them too close to the nipple and in the way for the baby to get on. What a baby needs to do is get their mouth around as much of the areola as possible. And sometimes the mom puts their hands right on the nipple instead of around the up above the areola. We need to teach them that breastfeeding should begin with the opposite breast from the one they began in the um, previous session. 
the mother should just hold her breast in a C position with the thumb above the nipple and fingers below it. So just around, right? And um, what I say is you want to kind of squish it like a sub sandwich to get it in that baby's mouth and up towards the roof of the mouth and get as much in as possible. Um, most newborns don't need to have the breast indented for breathing. They breathe through the side. Look at this picture where that nose is. They breathe through the side. Some babies' noses are a little bit more buried into the breast. And this one, she's getting the baby unlatched. So the baby's not completely on the breast well right now because she's taking the baby off the breast in this one. So, but remember, proper latch is extremely important. It is the best way to avoid cracks, blisters, and sore nipples. That's how they get cracks, blisters, and sore nipples is putting the baby on the nipple. So what I say to my moms is, if your baby comes off of breastfeeding and your nipple is flat or white, the baby was on wrong. The baby was just on the nipple. That's Why should your nipple be flat if they're on the whole areola? So it's just little, you know, pointers like that. Okay, suckling patterns. Um, so, is a term that specifically relates to giving or taking nourishment at the breast. Babies do, each baby does a little bit different. Some suck several times before swallowing, some suck and then swallow, suck and then swallow. After four days, the newborn gradually swallows with every suck. In the beginning, they're just getting used to breathing and sucking and swallowing and just getting coordinated with it all, right? Um, and we always wanna make sure, like in this picture down here on page 235, see how the baby's mouth is wide open that's what we wait for. Of course, this mom has the perfect breast for breastfeeding, and not all moms have those perfect nipples and perfect size to go in. But I want to show you this picture down low on D here. That See how far in that nipple gets pulled in? It's amazing because they have to get to where the milk ducts are, which are above the areola. Okay. Then, and we have more to talk about with that, but removing the infant from the breast, that picture on the right-hand side, you insert your finger into the corner in the infant's mouth, like you've seen the picture, to break the suction. And then remove breast before infant starts to suck and place downward pressure on the infant's chin. Because sometimes they try to grab a hold again and then it hurts when you pull them off. So here's that latch again. See how that baby's wide open mouth that's what you want. You don't want pursed lips, otherwise they're just gonna get on the nipple. Okay. So noisy, sucking, clicking sound, dimpling of the cheeks, they look like a little fish, may indicate improper mouth position. Repositioning is required. We wanna see, they can start out going num, num, for just to get the milk started. Then you wanna see the long draws on the nipple and right in front of their ears, you wanna watch for swallowing and you want it to be rhythmic. And noisy and clicking is not, um, they're not on correctly, they're not feeding correctly and we don't want them to get bad habits. Okay, evaluating intake of the infant. So that letdown, it's that tingling sensation with milk dripping from the nipple. Sometimes women can be out in public that are breastfeeding and hear a baby cry and have letdown. So infant nurses for 10 to 15 minutes per breast, eight times a day, I, I would know that. An audible swallow should be heard and infant appears relaxed after the feeding. We call it milk drunk. Infant has six to eight wet diapers a day passes several stools a day, and breasts should usually feel soft after the feed. But we wanna also prevent the problems before we get, the other day I was at work and, oh my God, her nipples just look like hamburger. And so some babies just don't have the mouth that opens wide enough. Sometimes babies are tongue tied. I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Some moms don't want the help. They think they can do it themselves. She wanted the help. I helped her a lot that day. But um, so again, frequency and duration, typically every two to three hours. But you, there's all kinds of things that can be an issue. Okay, so like the sleepy baby. Oh, I skipped over you guys. Um, 
Baby Friendly Hospital. You can read all about it. It's just what hospitals go to these days. Me personally, I think it's gone a little bit too far, but um, it has a good premise that they just want moms rooming, babies rooming in with mom and bonding and breastfeeding and things like that. Okay, so you can read about that if you'd like. It's not on the quiz. Okay, so sleepy newborn. Some are sleepy and need to be awakened for feed. Sometimes you literally have to unwrap them, use a cold, wet washcloth, things like that. But again, what did we say earlier? Brain, uh, sugar is essential to a newborn's brain. So to get that sugar they need to eat, okay? So you may have to hold them upright after you've undressed them, change their diaper, talk to them. Believe it or not, they hate having their back and feet rubbed. Someday they're gonna love it probably, but um, as newborns, they don't. And that gets them awake to eat. If they're fussy, find out why they're fussy. Do they need their diaper changed? Do they have a burp in them? Are they trying to pass that meconium? Are they screaming? Stiffening and crying after feeding starts can indicate a sore mouth. What's going on in their mouth? Gas. When baby goes to breast and it's just fidgety, they go to breast, they suck, then they pull off, draw up their knees, things like that. That's a sign of pain. And what I tell my patients is newborns can't differentiate between the pain of hunger and the pain of gas or other kind of pain. So they think feeding is going to help, but a couple sucks and it doesn't. So when that's the case, I say, you know, the breast always should be a happy place to be for a newborn, not a stressful place to be. So if they're screaming and all that, I mean, sometimes you have to let them scream a little bit till you, they figure out what they've got. I'm saying if they're drawing up their knees and you can tell that they're not hungry right now, something else is going on, then pick them up and settle them. Okay. So inverted nipples. Some women have genuinely inverted and some just are inverted and just need to come out. There's a, there's a pathological and a, just one that needs to be worked on a little bit. Some moms can roll them gently between their thumb and forefinger to break up the tissue in there to get the nipples to come out better. Okay. And then um, nipple confusion, we'll talk about that. Breast engorgement, we'll talk way more about that. And nipple trauma with latch. So we'll get into that in a minute. Okay. So frequency and duration of feedings. Breast milk is digested more rapidly than formula. Feedings occur again every two to three hours around the clock. Some babies go four to five hours. If they're a healthy eight pound baby, that's usually fine. If fed frequently during the daytime, infant may have longer sleep periods at night. And until meconium is passed, they may consume 15 to 30 mils per feeding. By one week of age, around 60 to 90 mils. And of course, the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends breastfeeding as the optimum nutrition from birth through the first year of life. And we all know that there are some people who would give anything to be able to breastfeed and can't. What if they're a breast cancer survivor? What if there was just, if they had childhood molestation and can't put anything near their breast, things like that? You know, we have to not judge. And if people say, I don't want to breastfeed, you know, we may say, is there a reason why? And sometimes it's, oh, it didn't work last time. Well, can we explore it this time and help you more? Things like that. Or if they say no, then you know what? It's their choice. It's absolutely their choice. And we all need to respect it. So again, length of time for feeding, about 15 minutes per breast. Again, if too short, infant only receives the four milk, which will cause the infant to become hungry sooner, th sooner than if she received, baby received the hind milk. Burp the infant after feeding and alternate breasts used to start feedings with. So if you end it on the left, next feed, start on the right. Cues that the infant is receiving adequate feeding. Slowing of the sucking pattern, falls asleep at the breast, breast feels soft and empty, has at least six wet diapers and several stools in a 24 hour period, and of course the infant's gaining weight. Very normal for the a newborn to lose a little bit of weight the first 24, 48 hours, up to 10% of their birth weight. But if infant's gaining, that's awesome. Question, a woman with flat nipples will not be able to breastfeed, true or false? It is false. We may have to work harder, things like that, but it's not an absolute. Okay, 
So there's always going to be special breastfeeding situations. Um, like multiple births, premature birth, women who have had breast surgery, and delayed feedings. Um, okay, sorry guys, I got a little bit ahead of myself here again. So, before that, let's talk about breast engorgement, okay? I need to add this to the PowerPoints. I just ran out of time. So on page 238, let's talk about this breast engorgement. So early, regular, and frequent nursing helps prevent breast engorgement. But if engorgement does occur and the breast and areola are very tense and distended, the woman can pump to get it soft, okay, or manual expression. Cold applications between feedings and heat just before feedings may help to reduce discomfort and engorgement, okay? Manual massage can help get some of that milk out to get it soft enough, right? Nipple trauma, again, we talked about cracks, blisters, redness, bleeding can occur. Correct position of the newborn is the pre best preventative measure. Hygiene, sh the mother should never use soap on her breasts and always wear a supporter bra, but not too tight. Okay, sorry, now we're on special situations. Okay, so, Multiple births. The mother's body adjusts the milk supplied to the greater demand of multiple newborns. So women are made to be able to breastfeed more than one child. So twins can be fed one at a time or simultaneously. And there's just different techniques for holding and feeding when we do that. Okay. So premature birth. Breastfeeding babies who are too preemie, they don't have that... Um, urge to suck yet they don't have the rooting reflex in them yet they're too immature for that so it can be quite quite the challenge to get a preemie to eat but we want them to get the colostrum because of its immunological advantages so lots of times what happens is we have the mother pump and then we put a tube down in to feed them gabage feedings okay until the baby can breastfeed but mom will pump her own milk, and that's what the um, preemie baby gets, if at all possible. Okay, and then the previous breast surgery, it can influence, but not always, successful breastfeeding. And the incision was around the areola of the breast, as nerves or lactiferous ducts may be damaged, then you might not be able to, but sometimes you can. It, again, depends on where the incision is, what, how much they did, how much did they take out a bunch of the um, ducts for breastfeeding. A silicone breast implant does not negatively influence breastfeeding because they didn't take the milk ducts out and they didn't mess with the nipple, okay? So delayed feedings, when a baby can't be fed yet, um, if they're tachypnic, we don't feed babies because babies shunt away from their gut to help with that breathing. And so if you put food in there and the gut of the newborn isn't working, you can get neck, remember, necrotizing enterocolitis. So we don't feed babies that are tachypnic. Okay, so we should get the mom pumping and we should have them um, pump every for 10 minutes on each breast about every three hours. And the weaning from the pump should be gradual so that the mother doesn't get engorged. Okay, now on to storing and freezing breast milk. So breast milk should be used or stored within one hour of pumping. They found out a little bit different things, but test for a little bit longer, but for quiz purposes, it's within one hour. Milk at room temperature for more than one hour increases potential for bacterial contamination. Container size should hold no more than one feeding. So every frozen, if you, if women pump and freeze the milk, it should be one feeding in each bag. Safely stored in frozen or in glass hard plastic containers. Polystream bottles are not designed for frozen milk storage. Polymers become unstable with heat with, when heated after freezing. So we just need to make sure our patients know that to pick the right type of container if they're gonna store frozen breast milk, okay? Then milk can be thawed in a refrigerator for 24 hours, and that's the best way to do it because it preserves the immunoglobulins. I, or by holding the container under running warm water. And then of course, you know how you test it on your inside of your wrist to make sure you didn't get it too hot. 
So what you're going to want to know is the milk can be stored in a refrigerator at 4 Celsius, 39 Fahrenheit, for 96 hours, or in the freezer, negative 4 Celsius, for up to 3 to 6 months. I think on the quiz it asks you 3 months. Freezing breast milk can destroy some antimicrobial factors. So, um, it's, but for moms who have to go back to work, then that's a perfect thing to be able to do. And microwaving of breast milk is not advised because not only is it heat heated um, spottily, but it can destroy immune, fac immune factors in the milk. Okay, maternal nutrition. You need to know this too. Mother needs an additional 500 calories over the non-pregnant diet. We learned that before, but this is a good reminder. Eight to 10 glasses of fluids per day. Some foods eaten by mother may cause a change in the taste of the milk or cause the infant to develop gas. So how this goes is it used to, people used to say, oh, broccoli gives babies gas. Oh, mom shouldn't eat chocolate, it gives babies gas. No, every baby's different. So how you do that is eat the chocolate. If the baby's fussy, was it the chocolate or the baby just got fussy? Try it one more time. If you see a relation, then you take that out of your diet. If the baby responds to broccoli that way, to ice in a row, then you know it is the broccoli. See what I mean? Process of elimination. And medications taken by the mother may be secreted in breast milk. So the doctor should always be the one to go over their medications and make sure that it's compatible with breastfeeding. Weaning. When to wean the baby? There's really no best time to wean and gradual weaning is the preferred method. There's different techniques and the one that seems to work the best is eliminate one feeding at a time, emit daytime feedings first, eliminate the favorite feeding last. A lot of babies like to go to bed at night, you know, mom soothing them with the breastfeed. In younger infants, formula will need to be provided to substitute for that feeding, you know, if they're not on cereal and food and things like that during the day. Infant will need comfort nursing if they're tired or if they get sick. Sometimes it's hard to stop when they um, don't feel good. Breast pumping is not advised in order to decrease the milk supply cycle. So in other words, you maybe feel like the breasts need to be emptied out, but if you pump then it stimulates more for the next feed so it's cause and demand so it's it's kind of um defeating the purpose of weaning if you pump so advise the mother to wear a snug bra around the clock to help alleviate discomfort from engorgement some women if they do it gradually if they don't get too uncomfortable other women are hard rocks for a few days and pretty miserable So just remember, if a mother must wean abruptly for any reason, she's probably going to get engorged. And so things like cabbage leaves applied help dry things out, ice packs, analgesics, and um, sometimes some women even tighten a sheet or something around the breast to keep it firm so they don't, it helps the dry process they feel like and, and the discomfort. So the breast engorgement usually caused by temporary congestion of veins and lymphatics not always milk accumulation, usually resolves 24 to 36 hours. And again, support a bra and milk production ceases within a few days to a week. Okay, formula feeding. You know, women feed formula for many reasons. And again, we need to just educate and let them make an informed choice. Some do both, some do one or the other. Some are embarrassed by breastfeeding or may have little social support. Others are uncomfortable when they can't see the amount of milk they take. I can't tell you how many moms I say, I hear say, I don't think the baby's getting enough. I, I don't think the baby's getting enough. And we just constant reassurance with that. Sometimes we'll even weigh the baby before a feed and then after and show her, look at how many ounces your baby got. So that something, sometimes things like that can really help a patient, okay? Um, so regardless of the choice for formula feeding, the nurse should fully support the mother and reassure her that the infant can receive good nutrition and emotional closeness. 
So the things we need to talk about with them are the different types of formula. Most of them are modifications of cow's milk. Um, Similac Advance and Infamil Premium are examples of cow's milk. We use Infamil at our hospital. Infants who do not tolerate cow's milk may have to have a specialty formula. Okay, they come in ready to feed, which that's expensive, concentrated liquid, and powdered. Powdered is the less expensive one choice than other formula options. Okay, but regardless of type, it is important to follow manufacturer's instruction on the preparation and storage of formula products. Safety alert. And unfortunately, too many people do this because they try to save money because formula is expensive over dilution because they try to make it last longer. But even and under dilution can be a problem, too, and they can um, result in serious, serious illness if um, parents do that. OK. So ready to feed formulas, remember, require no dilution and we just need to teach moms how to you know, wash your hands before feeding. Bottles and nipples can be washed in hot soapy water using a nipple brush and um, rinsed well. Bottles can be washed in the dishwasher, but nipples should be washed by hand to slow their deterioration, okay? And if we're using the concentrated liquid formula, just be careful about what kind of water you um, dilute it with, okay? So remember too that bottled cow's milk and evaporated milk are nutritionally inadequate for use as an infant formula and stress the kidneys of the newborn and young infant. So we need to go by what the American Academy of Pediatrics recommend. Okay. So feeding the infant. So um, formula is digested more slowly than breast milk. And most formula-fed infants initially feed about every three to four hours. Don't microwave the formula. Don't prop the bottle. I would know this slide, you guys. Um, hold bottle so nipple is always full of formula. You should burp, teach them to burp the baby after feeding four ounces and again when the bottle is empty. And this is the one good thing about bottle feeding is you can involve the partner and family in the bottle feeding of the infant and a mom can get rest at night. Somebody else can get up with the baby and help them out. Okay, so we already talked about the bottled cow's milk. Okay, discharge planning. Remember we talked about all our discharge planning literally begins in admission. See what they're lacking, what their needs are, what their educational needs are. And due to the quickness of discharge from the hospital, teaching often begins even before they're psychologically ready to hear it. And they'll go home and not remember a darn thing you said. They even say they only still only remember 10% of what you teach them. So what I try to do is really teach the most important stuff first, because after a while they just hear you droning, you know. Care maps can be used, provide sufficient teaching materials. We send a whole folder home with them full of educational stuff so they can refer to that when they're home and ready to learn. Then again, early discharge planning and health promotion. This was a, again a little extra slide. Greatest need is education, always education. Mother must know how to prevent infection, danger signs to report for herself and her newborn, of course, fevers, odd smells, things like that. Nurses can um, provide education on how to care for newborn and then observes parents to see if additional education is needed. And then postpartum self-care teaching. Again, ample written material. Make sure that they have follow-up appointments and stress to them how important those follow-up appointments are. They for the mom, the appointment, the first appointment is usually at two weeks and it verifies that involution is proceeding normally and they can identify any complications as soon as possible. At the two week appointment, they also assess how the perineum is doing, if they had a C-section, how that incision is healing. The healthcare provider does a vaginal exam to check the uterus to ensure that the uterus is the size it should be at this stage of the game. Breasts are carefully examined for any signs of problems and occasionally a complete blood count is done and vitamins or iron supplements or both are ordered if anemia is present, which can happen after delivery. And then of course, 
the woman has the opportunity to ask questions of the doctor any physical or psychological issues that may be happening with them and their family. That's a good time to do that. Then hygiene. Usually women like to take a daily shower, at least we hope so, but especially because they um, have that, they perspire a lot. Remember, they're getting rid of all those extra fluids, so they're diuresing. Also, perineal care should be continued until the flow of lochia stops. They should never use douches and tampons for sanitary until the doctor gives them the go-ahead. They shouldn't use deodorant pads because you use them for longer and the perfumes in them can cause irritation down there so I always tell my moms that then sexual intercourse coitus should be avoided until the episiotomy is fully healed and the lochia flow has stopped having sexual relations earlier can lead to infection trauma or an, of course an unintended pregnancy they can use a water soluble lubricant if they decide they want to have sexual intercourse and um, that'll make it more comfortable for the woman but again emphasize that breastfeeding is not a reliable contraceptive okay diet and exercise well balanced diet of course moderate exercise is good we don't want them to overdo it at first especially if they have stitches anywhere or had you know a really difficult delivery because constipation can be a problem, we teach them to do continue with high fiber foods. And breastfeeding mothers should not try to lose weight while nursing. Remember, they're supposed to eat 500 more calories, not less. So after nursing is done, that's when they can do their diet. But actually, breastfeeding helps women to lose weight sometimes because the baby takes a lot of it. But in the formula feeding mother should delay a strict reducing diet until released by her health care provider. Okay. Then danger signs to watch for and report. Hemorrhage, infection, and thrombosis are the most common complications. So it is extremely important, and we have it in our typed written information that we send home with them. A fever higher than 100.4. Persistent lochia rubra, remember the red, or lochia that has a foul odor. Bright red bleeding, particularly if the lochia has changed to cirrhosis or alba already. Um, <clears throat> prolonged after pains, pelvic or abdominal pain, or a constant backache. There might be something going on in there that we don't know about. Signs of a UTI, pain, redness, or tenderness in the calf, localized breast tenderness or redness. Some women get infected milk ducts, things like that. Discharge pain, redness, or separation of any suture line on either your perineum or the cesarean or, you know, the episiotomy. Or if they're having prolonged or pervasive feelings of depression or being let down and generally not enjoying life, they need to discuss that with their doctor without feeling any shame or any um, problems that they're going to be judged. Okay, And reassure the mother that the hospital staff is available by telephone. You know, I always say to them, we're here 24-7. And if you need us, you call us. Okay. And then, of course, infant car seats, I always tell them you use it the way the manufacturer recommends. Don't even drive around a parking lot without your child in the car seat the way the manufacturer recommends. Okay. Newborn discharge care. So this planning begins for the newborn at birth. And because of the short stays, the the need, the teaching needs to be ongoing while they're there as a patient, of course, with the parents, the family. Instruct parents to continue close observation of the umbilical cord and report redness or drainage. Again, apply diaper below the umbilical stump. Give infant sponge baths until cords fall off. When you see things repeated like this, it may tell you that you really need to know that. If discharged before 72 hours old, a follow-up visit with a pediatrician is recommended within two days of discharge. Okay. So most babies are checked at our hospital. Every baby is checked by a healthcare professional at birth and before discharge. And they are assessed at this early check for jaundice, feeding adequacy, urine and stool output, and behavior. And of course, we weigh them every night to make sure they're not losing too much weight. We keep track of their INOs in the hospital to see if they're, you know, breastfeeding well and we um, do a jaundice meter every night to make sure their jaundice isn't getting too high so things like that okay 
Then newborns are usually seen for a well baby check around six to eight weeks of age. And so when providing the teaching, we should emphasize the value of these um, appointments. They can catch things that might have gotten missed or that are just now coming to light. Immunization information will be provided and car seat safety. And just remember, they should be in the back seat facing the rear until two years of age. And this I just thought was a cute little picture of babies going home from the hospital. One on the left, all snug, just the way it should be in that car seat. And then the one little one in the middle in the pink. And then I just thought it was kind of cool, the one up top, look at that teeny, teeny, tiny little thing. Then it's bigger on the left, and then that one on the right, day of going home. What a day that would be, be able to take that teeny little baby home finally after probably months and months of care. So anyways, that's it for Chapter 9, and um, good luck. Have a great day.